at 6 p.m. we'll call our meeting order. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please have roll call, Marie. Mrs. Medina? Here. Mrs. Rayle? Here. Mrs. Hett? Here. Mr. Krings? Here. Mr. Bembo? Here. Mr. Davis? Here. Mrs. Lee? Here. Thank you, Marie. Um, next, we'll go on to the student representative's report. Carissa? Um, Sportainment Night collected $4,382, which will be donated to the Tri-City Dreams Foundation, which is uh, enough to send a whole family is the most we've ever raised before. So, and then the blood drive was also the most successful ever. We had the most people contribute blood. Um, the fire and ice um, will the dance will be February sixteenth, and we actually have this new thing where we have an ice prince and an ice princess. So the sophomores will be able to vote on who's the ice prince and the ice princess. Um, some other great news is we collected $2,682 for our community candles program. Um, this was $500 over the amount we collected last year. Um, our, coffee our coffee shop is also uh, very successful. The work studies class runs that, and they collect about $200 per week, and most of the money goes to the supplies, but other money goes into... Um, an account we use for something for to help them learn. Um, in second semester, the students of the work studies class will go more into business, where they will get to um, learn about how the money flows throughout the school. So, um, they also have some ideas for spring and early summer, which is the iced um, coffee and sun tea. And next year, they're going to be discussing the um, possibility of maybe having smart snacks. And that is it. All right. Thank you very much. <coughs> she's going to Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you. And next, I would like to uh, Thank you. <laughs> recognize this week is Wisconsin Adult School Crossing <laughs> Guard Recognition Week. So to the crossing guards that we have in our district, thank you very much for all you do to keep our students safe on some very busy roads. And I'd also like to welcome our Boy Scouts visiting tonight. I believe it's Troop 111. Good to have you here. If you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to come up and ask. So welcome. <coughs> okay, next we'll move on to the minutes. Okay, I would make a motion that we approve the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of December 8, 2014 and the Special Board of Education meeting open and full session meetings of December 15, 2014. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of December 8th and the Special Board of Education meeting open and closed session minutes of 2000, or December 15, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Those minutes are approved. Marie, do we have any comments from the other team? No. Okay, let's move on to committee reports. Business services, John? Uh, we met on January 5th and our meeting started at 6 o'clock and there was no public comment. We uh, had a item we were going to discuss, but we tabled to, to a future meeting. That was the audit service contract, so that's uh, been tabled. Uh, we did have a couple updates and reports. We had a revenue limit energy assumptions, which uh, basically we had the discussion of which looks like we're going to get a presentation on the rest of it tonight. Um, as far as regards to, uh, I believe it's Act 32 in regards to that. Uh, with that, we have no other agenda items, and I present the uh, meeting minutes as printed. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes of the Business Service Committee of January 5th, 2015. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Thank you, John. Next, we'll move on to personnel services. <coughs> personnel services met last Monday at 6 o'clock and there was no public comment. And from that meeting, we have nine consent agenda items and they are as follows. Number one, the committee recommends and I move to approve the two. Uh, staff appointments. Secondly, the committee recommends and I move to approve the two support staff resignations. And then we have seven um, policy review 
Um, and these are all for second reading so that we've, we've had a, the thorough discussion on these. Um, number three, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 343.2, class size for second reading. Four, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 345.11, procedures for academic excellence scholarships for second reading. Fifth, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 345.12, procedures for Wisconsin technical excellence scholarships for second reading. Sixth, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 422, admission for non-resident pupils for second reading. Seventh, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy uh, 423, public school open enrollment for second reading. Eight, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 423 rule, procedure for processing public school open enrollment applications for second reading. Um, finally, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 424, participation of non-public school students in programs and district services for second reading. And I'd like to make a correction on the motion for PS9. It was not unanimous. There was one dissenting vote, and that was mine. I'd second that. Okay. And I, does anybody want something held out? Why don't we hold up PS9? We can have a little bit more discussion. We got some information yes, on that today. So there's a motion and a second to approve PS9. One through PS8. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, I've had problems with uh, policy 424, participation of non-public public school students in programs and district services for second reading, and Maureen has done some calling and some research on it for us. And you want to just give us the two sentence analysis? You had a question regarding the funding and how that works for part-time enrolled students. So a student who might go to private high school here in town comes to Lincoln for two courses. We put that student into our account and there's supposed to be a formula that works out an allocation of FTE for us to receive. And then what, I, what the question really was, was because if that student were a choice student receiving a voucher at the private high school, would that funding over there be reduced? And the answer is no. We wouldn't know if that student is a voucher student. That wouldn't be anything we would have. I mean, we couldn't, I mean, that's not for us to do anything with anyhow. But, but what the state has done is with our diminishing pot of money to public schools, we've got the voucher money going to the, the voucher schools, the private schools. Then they can send two students over here to take two classes. The voucher school loses no money but the money to support those two classes that student is taking comes out of the pot out of Madison. So it's, you know, it's a double whammy. And I just don't think it's being fair to the public schools. We're in a huge crunch, and it's going to get worse. And for that, I cannot support this. Uh, and I don't know if you know, it came down from, you know, Madison, this is what you must support. I think if some districts don't support it, maybe they'll take another look at it, because it's just not fair. I know in our discussion Monday, um Part of that addressed special needs students um, and Title I funding. I, is it possible that we can have it worded so that part is broken out and this simply addresses a high school class or does it, is there a requirement that it's all grouped together under the same heading? I guess? Well right now we're voting on this motion as it, you know, right. it's written. And what, but what if we say no, then I mean, I don't know. I don't, we would still have to administer as... I just think it sends a message. If you don't have a policy on it. But Brian stated that we may be in jeopardy of losing federal funding if we don't have a policy. Uh, I, I think that's more a matter of, of making sure that we follow the requirements that the federal government has for Title I. Whether we have a policy or not may be irrelevant. I mean, if we accept the funding, we have to follow the guidelines specifically for Title I. I, I think the question of whether we have to have a policy by in and of itself, if they're separated, those are all separate issues for, for discussion. But where did this policy originated from? Is it a federal policy or is it a state policy? Well, this is to address really the state, the changes that were made in at the state level. At the state level, once once course options started the whole, we're revising the existing mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. This really helps actually for us to administer. We we have to have something in place in order to administer. You might, I mean, it might not be what we like, but 
I think if we would ask legal counsel, they'd say you must have some sort of policy, probably to protect yourself. And we would still be bound by the statutes, though. Right. So, I mean, if students showed up and we didn't have a policy, we would still have to. Correct. This just defines it a little better so we know how to handle those students when I they think, come into our system. You know, when, when we talk to our legislators mm -hmm. this coming year, I think this is something that has to be foremost on our agenda, along with many other things, but I think this needs to be addressed or brought to their attention. I would agree. I agree, too. Any other discussion on this one? <clears throat> okay. It was motion to second to approve PS9. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Aye. No. Aye. Mr. Krings, may I ask who made that first on that motion and second? Sandy and Mary. Well, we held it out, so we got to make a new motion. Oh. oh, that's right. Okay, I'm sorry. So I make, make a motion to approve PS9. Okay. Now we have a motion and a second to approve PS9. We have a second. I'll second it. <laughs> now. now we have a motion and a second to approve PS9. Thank Can't you. wait to get it over with. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Was that Larry? Yes. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. Oh. <laughs> um, then we had an update and report on class size and section reports. Um, we we're pretty much holding our own. We haven't seen large increases in class sizes, which is really you know, great for us. Um, we're going to do, uh, on a report, we're just going to do some different things on labeling so it's easier to understand when we're looking at last year, this year, and whatever. Um, and with that, I would move that the, um, the committee minutes from January 5th to be um, approved as printed with the correction for the vote for PS9 from the committee meeting. Okay, a motion a second to approve the meeting minutes of Personnel Service Committee of January 5th with the noted correction. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh. Oh. Okay. And then, <laughs> um, we have some other personnel services. Do you want that in new business? New business, okay. Can I just go back to the policy for a minute on, on PS9? You know, I, I think, you know, to, to voice your um, opposition to it is, is a good thing to do. But I think when we put a policy together, it's really protect the district and how we choose to administer something when it comes to us. So really what the policy is doing, we're revising a current one that we have, and we're, we're also incorporating you know, the new rules, but at the same time defining it so that it gets administered the way we want it administered. So really the policy helps us. And I, don't, I don't suppose that makes any of you feel better, but um, I think it, it gives guidelines for us as to how we're going to put it in place rather than having it. You know, I think the dictated. opposition is that we have to do it all. It, exactly. I yeah, understand that. I understand the law, that. The law is a bigger problem right. than the policy. Right. So I just wanted to make that. Could you pass? Easily. That's not a good rule. All right. Thanks. Indeed. Next, we'll move on to uh, educational services. And Thanks, John. Educational services committee met last uh, Monday at 6.34 and there was no public comment. We had um, one actual item which was about establishing class size for open enrollment. And Colleen Dickman, who was our superintendent, shared an updated DPI PI 9422 form, <laughs> which was attachment one, A1. Um, and we had an updated attachment for that and explain the data on the form, specifically class size limits. <coughs> By filing this form, the district is allowed to limit special education class sizes when considering open enrollment applications. It was noted that the district to date has not yet had to deny any applications. Okay, and so I, uh, the committee recommends and I move that we approve the class sizes the sections, special education case loads, and new spaces available for the February 2015 open enrollment window per tables on the DPI's PI 9422 form, that, which is entitled Record of Decision for Appeal of Open Enrollment Denial Due to Space for Accepting or Denying Open Enrollment Applications for the 2015-16 school year as presented in updated attachment a one. Second. Okay, motion is second to approve yes one. 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, then we went on to <coughs> updates in our um, one update. <coughs> Excuse me. Was about language arts curriculum and instruction uh, and the CII subcommittee update. Roxanne Filtz, who is our secondary literacy specialist, and Jennifer Wilhorn, our elementary literacy specialist, were present to update the board on the English language arts curriculum process. <coughs> Roxanne had an online timeline presentation that was shared regarding the phases of the ELA curriculum and instruction CII subcommittee, which has been working on <coughs> has been working on in the late year CII acquisition cycle. The committee broke um, into secondary and elementary work groups to accomplish the necessary steps in the cycle. Secondary language arts will be ready to bring a curriculum and acquisition plan to the Educational Services Committee for approval in the spring of this school year. Elementary language arts will do the same in the spring of 2015-16. I thank the subcommittee for all the hard work that was evidenced by the timeline presentation. I think we, we all expressed a um, gratitude for all the hard work that all our subcommittees uh, It's just very impressive. And so we were um, very grateful for that. So with that, the uh, um, committee recommends and I move adoption of the minutes for the Educational Services Committee of January 5th, 2015. Second. Okay, motion to second to approve the meeting minutes of the Ed Service Committee of January 5th, 2015. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Ann. Mm -hmm. Next, we can move on to agenda referrals or information requests. Does anybody have anything? No. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to know, um, although I don't want to, I don't want to have our people spend a lot of time on it, but I'd like to know how long it takes to implement this open this open enrollment business. Uh, is there is there an easy way to take keep track of that or not? The time spent on open enrollment? Yeah, the hours that we have to spend to do this. Well, um, it'll be a year long process because we have open enrollment all year round. So we could I mean we can start is today it, and report back to the Is next it year. difficult though to do? <laughs> to keep Time. I, and I want something that's uh, uh, to the minute. Are you good with an estimate? Yeah. Yeah, estimate. <laughs> I think Morgan and, and Kim can probably have a conversation about the approximate time it takes because there are those that open enrollment period on the you know on the front end in February, and then it goes through right now April, and then there's year-round open enrollment. So each time we have one of those, it takes you know time. There's calls back and forth between districts and so on. Well, but we can, there, we can there are times when I question <clears throat> the good that comes out of that. I know it's a good concept, but the implementation of it, especially if it's full year, just puts a burden on the district to keep track of it mm -hmm. and again and again. And uh, I don't know why we couldn't do that in a shorter window uh, or do it less. It used to be that way. Yeah, you see why. We'll see what we can do. There's several resolutions on that. And I won't really wait another year. Yeah, the resolution. We'll try to get something together before that. Yeah, there was a resolution to go back to the yeah. Yeah. Any other requests? Okay. Next we can move on to our legislative agenda. Okay. I um, actually read this legislative <coughs> update three times trying to condense it. And I think it's important enough that I'm going to share <coughs> share all with you. Um, just to let you know what's on the horizon as far as the, the upcoming bills that our new leg legislature is looking at. Um, and I, I fully agree with Sandy's comments about policy, and I think this is, goes right along those same lines. I mean, there's things we're going to have to do that we don't like to do. And I think we need to, I think we need to inform our public so that they understand as much as we do, which isn't a lot, because it changes so much. Um, but I think it's really important that we're aware of it. I think it's important we talk to our legislators. I mean, I've been doing it 14 years, and sometimes I feel like, why? Because they tell you, they listen, they sit, and they talk to you, and then you hear on the news in a week that they voted, and there was not even any discussion. And that's really frustrating as a board member. But I'm not going to quit, and I, and I hope that none of you are, because I think it's really important. It's important for our kids. 
Okay, so first of all, um, the assembly bill repeals, they have, the assembly GOP leaders are releasing their school accountability bill and they expect quick, that quick action. Assembly Bill 1 repeals current interventions for schools and replaces them with an academic review system that would assign letter grades to schools based on student test scores and other measures. The system would be administered by DPI overseen by an academic review board known as ARB and in effect for the 2017-2018 school year. The bill gives persistently low performing public and private schools seven years to improve before the sanctions kick in. It also would give the board authority to create charter schools. Now, that's this board, not our board. Assembly leaders had promised it would be the first bill introduced this session, and it is expected to be on a fast track. The assembly speaker is on record saying he would like to have it passed out of the assembly no later than the end of January. A public hearing on the bill in the Assembly Education Committee is scheduled for 10 a.m. next Wednesday, January 14th, which is Wednesday with the committee vote expected the next day. Assembly leadership has indicated the bill will likely be voted on by the full assembly either January 20th or the 22nd. So then it goes on to talk about the Academic Review Board, which would oversee this new accountability system. The bill establishes a state-level Academic Review Board that would create a new system for evaluating schools beginning in the 2017-18 academic year. The ARB would be made up of members with staggered four-year terms. State School Superintendent Tony Evers and six members nominated by him, including a public school principal, a charter school staffer, a private voucher administrator and school teacher, and one representative each from the state's technical colleges and University of Wisconsin system. One at-large member and <coughs> one technical college representative nominated by Governor Walker. And also one nominee from Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald, Assembly Minority Leader Peter Barca, and Senate Minority Leader Jennifer Schilling. Voss and Fitzgerald would be able to choose whomever they want. Barca would need to choose a charter school principal and Schilling a public school teacher. The ARB would review public schools, independent charter schools, and private voucher schools and determine whether they are making academic progress assign consequences for failing schools, and determine incentives for exceptional schools. For persistently low-performing public and private schools, there would be seven years of improvement plans and sanctions before the schools would be either converted into independent charter schools or funding would be cut. The WASB supports bringing private voucher schools into the state accountability system, and we have a resolu resolution that states Private and parochial schools that accept state funding through taxpayer finance vouchers must be held to the same statutory requirements, testing requirements, and accountability standards as public schools without exception. Okay, then they go on to talk about letter grades and the state takeovers of local schools and funding impacts. Under the proposed legislation, schools would be assigned letter grades of A, B, C, D, or F. Private schools could get two grades under the bill one for voucher student performance, and one for all students. For schools receiving a D or F grade, based on multiple measures, which would include test scores on math and reading, graduation and attendance rates, and the closure of achievement gaps between groups of students, there would be two steps of sanctions. Under step one, public schools or private schools with at least 20 students using vouchers that receive a D or F grade for three consecutive years must develop goals and implement an improvement plan, or the schools may comply with an alternate, alternative <coughs> improvement plan approved by the ARB. <coughs> Private voucher <coughs> schools would be allowed to apply voucher money to the improvement plan under the legislation, or could choose not to accept any new students for two years, or to withdraw completely from the voucher system for four school years before reapplying at the end of the two or four-year time period if an improvement plan is in place at the school. Under step two, if the ARB determines that a school is not making adequate progress under step one sanctions, any of the following may be imposed. Persistently low-performing public schools must be converted into an independent charter school either by the ARB or by the local school board. 
for a public school that is independent charter school or a private school, DPI must discontinue payments to the school. For private schools, the school may not accept any new students with vouchers for four school years. The private school may reapply to participate in the system after that time period. The WASB is on record as opposing efforts by the state to take over schools, and we have a, a resolution that says the WASB opposes the creation in Wisconsin of a recovery school district or a similar state-level authority designed to take over and attempt to improve the performance of low-performing public schools. Through WASB Resolution 3.21, the WASB also opposes the creation or operation of a state-level charter school authorizing body that would be legally empowered to authorize independent charter schools throughout the state. Not only would this be a state takeover of local schools, but it would reduce the amount of state aid to every public school district in the state. Independent charter schools are funded from a first draw on the general aid appropriation. The per-pupil payments made to independent charter schools are taken from general aides before any money is distributed to public school districts. As a result, as independent charters are created, state aid will be transferred away from students in the property poorest school districts in the state, including many rural districts, to support independent charter schools that are most likely to be located largely in urban areas. In fact, for every additional 1,000 pupils enrolling in independent charter schools, 8.075 million will be taken annually from general, equal, general equalization school aid sent to school districts. Under revenue limits, the effect of removing this money from general equalization aid is the potential 8.075 million increase in property taxes statewide. That amount will only grow as per pupil payments to independent charter schools are raised and more public schools are converted to independent charters. Converting public schools to independent charter schools would also be problematic in rural districts where there is only one school per grade. The bill says nothing about whether these independent charter schools would be housed. Under state statutes, school boards, subject to the authority vested in the annual meeting and to the authority and possession specifically given to other school district officers, have legal responsibility for the possession, care, control, and management of the property and affairs of the school district, except for property of the school district used for public library purposes. Will there be an effort to force school boards to sell their buildings as has been tried in Milwaukee? The question of what will remain of the local school board's authority in a district where an outside authorizer operates the schools needs to be answered. And last, the accountability bill allows use of different assessments. The bill also would allow all schools, schools to choose between alternative examinations approved by the board instead of the state standardized test approved by DPI. Since public schools are required by federal law to administer the state test, the effect is to permit private voucher schools to administer alternate exams, and the UW-Madison's Valued Added Research Center, which is known as VARC, would be tasked with comparing the results of different, of different results. Brad Carl, the associate director of VARC, <coughs> said that while this was technically possible, it would not be the most reliable way of comparing the performance of different schools. The most straightforward comparison is when all the kids take the same test, administered at the same time of year, on the same content, under similar conditions. This charge is a step back from action taken last session by the legislature, which at that time reaffirmed the requirement that all voucher students take the same state assessments as public school students. It also it also conflicts with the WASB's position about students in private schools and public schools should be required to take the same state assessments. Um, so I'm just going to say now, the upcoming meetings, they're, the, they're going to be starting to be on the floor January 20th. They're going to go through February 12th. Um, as you know, Governor Walker is going to deliver his State of the State address tomorrow evening and his budget address on Tuesday, February 3rd. Um, on January 14th, the Assembly Committee on Education is going to hold a public hearing on Assembly Bill 1, which is relating to a school review system, providing an exemption from emergency rule procedures, providing an exemption from rulemaking procedures, granting rulemaking authority, and making an appropriation. Um, 
And just a little sideline that they also have, there's currently differences between the houses on accountability legislation. The state senate has been working on a different proposal and has so far been cool to the assembly's version. According to Senator Paul Farrell, Republican from Milwaukee, who has been working on the accountability issue for months, there are still major issues lacking consensus. No senators have signed on as co-sponsors to Assembly Bill 1, while 32 Assembly Republicans are listed as co-authors. There is disagreement over placing sanctions for schools into law immediately, immediately instead of allowing a new board to create them, and over how that board should be picked. Farrow said he would rather see the superintendent have six appointments and the governor have six appointments. He also said he wants the board to be able to make rules rather than oversee ones already in law. That way the board could respond to changes to federal requirements, for example, instead of needing to rewrite laws. An earlier version of the bill required firing principals at low performing public and private schools and removing ineffective teachers and possibly replacing them with unlicensed ones. Those measures were pulled after Farrow objected. Senator Farrow has sought input from and worked with public and private school leaders, including the WASB, as he, as he developed his proposal. In contrast, the WASB has no input into the Assembly GOP, GOP proposal. Governor Walker is scheduled to deliver his State of the State on Tuesday, January 13th, and says he'll discuss some of his legislative initiatives, particularly what we'd like to do with school accountability and common core testing. With school, school accountability, he said he wants every school that takes public funds, both public and private, to have measures for the parents to make objective decisions about what's right for their son or daughter. The governor also says he'll unveil his budget on February 3rd and promises to continue efforts to trim property taxes. He says he would like to reduce corporate taxes, but warns that that may not happen in this budget, noting, as we prepare this next budget, it will be tough to cut all the taxes we'd like even further. So I just think, I mean, there's a lot there, but uh, I think we really need to um, be alert and make our voices known. You know, something caught my attention when you said that um, if schools are getting Ds or Fs for three years in a row, then they have seven years to try. Your kid could be going to school for 10 years in a DF situation. Like, I, I, mean, I, 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 mean, I mean, I see we need to do something, but this is so <coughs> But on the flip side of that, who's um, judging? Well, where are these schools? Because we've, we've, Robin Voss at that meeting we were at in January or last no, yeah. um, November. That, yeah. November it was. Robin Voss said it. Dr. Julie Mead from UW Madison. Where are these failing schools yeah. in Wisconsin? We have not seen any. If they implemented this right now, the majority of them would be in Milwaukee. Well, yeah, that's true. Right. That's and when that's there's a number. Of, well, I mean, they, there's a list. There's, there's a, a list of public ones, but most we of the true failing like schools are voucher schools. She said the rural districts schools. are the ones who are going to pay for it. That's well, it's yeah, and and the other other thing is is it is by, and that's the thing that's got to be kept brought forward is is that the only education that's guaranteed by state law and statute is public education. And that statute states, and of course the, this legislature has been very good at ignoring statutes because they do it with the rainy day, rainy day fund for uh, budgeting, but um, that statute states that public education gets their money first and they're doing it. They're breaking statute by taking that independent charter money first before the public education. So that's got to, you know, we just got to keep voicing that and, and, and try to get it through that you know, well, we still have testing. to follow legislation. The apples to apples testing. Well, and I think they need to address when we have charter schools that all of a sudden on Monday close their doors and leave the state and take, you know, have Milwaukee millions last, of dollars that they... Last month, Milwaukee had one. That, we had one, yeah. One. Well, you worse know. yet, what does it do with students? Right, but you I... You only get one crack at it, and you, know, you right. make a promise and you don't follow it through, and but it's child is doomed. The thing that's most discouraging to me is that um, I don't think our public here in Wisconsin Rapids thinks we're doing a terrible job. We need to be accountable. We've been accountable for a long time. We're doing a great job. But why do we need all this <laughs> scrutiny because we're not accountable, we are. So why waste that money to take it, to put it to other schools um, when I think we're doing fine? 
Well, and if the and if the data were showing that these charter schools, the students were doing better, but what I've been seeing they're is not. that they're not. They're not doing better. In fact, in a lot of cases, they're doing worse. Not in our district, but in other areas where they're implementing these charter schools, the students are actually doing worse than they are in the regular school system. They say those that can teach and those that can't teach make laws about teaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kelly, do you, is anyone going from the district to the hearing on Wednesday? Not that I'm asking. Mm -hmm. It's this week. It's this week. It's just oh, this, this week. week. Yeah. It's, it's the day after tomorrow. Well, we have the public here. How many of you think the rapid schools are doing a great job? I mean, they're in the rapid schools. How many of you think we do a wonderful job with the students? Raise your hands. How many think we're doing a terrible job? <laughs> I don't find them. But I, I, as long as no one from our district that. is going to that hearing, it, the, the, well, the, the suggestion was to write our legislators, uh, well, our assembly people, by before Wednesday. So, And I tried to do that, but I had some technical difficulties, but I'll try again. I sent one out to Did you? Quite likely. So Wednesday morning is the... Mm -hmm. okay. And I don't think we can say it strongly enough. The public needs to have their voice heard as well. Yes. We're seven people, several thousand in the community. So make your voice heard as well. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mary. Next we'll move on to bills. Okay, I would make a motion that the receipts be noted and the bills be paid as printed. Okay. Okay, we have a motion to second that receipts be noted and bills paid as printed. Can you please have a roll call, Mike? Mrs. Hett? Yes. Mr. Bembo? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Crane? Yes. John? I just want to note that on page three, um, we've got a rebate from Wicked High School Lights from Focus and Energy of $1,030, which I think is super. And on page 7, um, pallet sales, $187.50. And electronic recycling, $240.47. You know, everybody's doing whatever they can to, to keep the ship afloat. Those are things that don't end up in the landfill. Yeah. Move on to new business. The first item, item eight, possible action on employee appointments, resignation, and retirement requests. Now, <laughs> okay, we have um, two professional staff appointments. Um, the first in the world language. This was someone that was um, not a full FTE, and we had somebody in the world languages uh, retire, and so this person will become a full FTE now. And the second one um, at Grant Elementary, grade five, uh, this is on uh, for second semester and it's non-reoccurring. Um, and then we have our um, support staff appointments. So I, I move that the two professional staff appointments be, be what? approved. approved. <laughs> I didn't have a committee behind me. <laughs> and I move that the um, one support staff appointment be approved. I'll second that. Okay, motion is second to approve the two professional staff appointments and one support staff appointment listed in the handout. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Um, opposed? Motion and then carried. we have um, one early retirement request, and with this retirement, there are no benefits all associated with it. So um, I move for approval the <laughs> I move for to approve the one early retirement request. Second. Okay, motion is second to approve the Early retirement request listed. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next we can move on to item B discussion and possible action to authorize Honeywell to perform a district energy efficiency study. Yeah. Hi. Um, I brought this up at the Business Services Committee meeting, and Dr. Dickman wanted it brought up before the full board. Um, we've been looking at performance contracting. For a couple of years now, uh, been to several conferences on it, and Dan and I have spent quite a bit of time, and I, I think we found a group that that might fit some of our needs as far as performance contracting. I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, performance contracting changes were made, and we can 
now we can do energy efficiency projects and as long as they help pay for other things, delayed maintenance, building security, um, we can exceed the revenue limit for those projects. Uh, you have to have a, a certified energy performance contractor do an audit and we had Honeywell Group uh, Energy Services Group come in and do a preliminary audit for us. Um, a lot of you guys will recognize Honeywell that all of our controls are Honeywell pretty much throughout the building. So we have a, a history with them dating back to the 70s. Um, we felt pretty confident with these guys. It's a, a bigger company. A lot, of, a lot of smaller performance contractors have shot up because of the changes in the law. And there's a lot of them out there. And I've been to, I've researched several different ones. And we think uh, the energy services group here um, that I brought tonight would be a good fit for us. And I guess without further ado, um, Josh Hounsel, um, Chuck Geary, and Dave Holkstra are from Energy Services Group. They have a short PowerPoint for you to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Ed, what, what's yeah. performance contract? I don't understand that term. Basically, you can exceed the revenue limit if you have energy savings from updates to cover the cost of that over over the life of the building, which could be 20 years, uh, 20 years or less, pretty much. Uh, it's several districts or districts around us have been doing projects through this: uh, Nakusa, Pittsville, Stevens Point, Marshfield. And if anything, I've been kind of dragging my feet on it because I was unsure. So I, you know, this group I, I think really makes sense with with our equipment, and basically the. The updates we make now will pay for themselves, and, and they have to guarantee that they'll pay for themselves over the life of the project. So it's, it's kind of a no-risk situation for the school district, and it'll allow us to do a lot of things now that we, you know, like Mrs. Head brought up, you know, we're doing small projects now. We did some LED lighting, that's where those rebates came from. Um, but taking it out of our operations budget, you know, we can just do little projects at a time. This would allow us to do more things up front and realize the savings for longer, if that makes any sense. So it's just something to, to think about here. I uh, appreciate your time, and I'll, I'll let them explain it because they can probably do a lot better job than I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And I really appreciate the board's time tonight. Uh, my name is Josh Hounsel. Yeah. Again, this is Dave Huckster, my engineering manager and Chuck Geary. Um, I've been in uh, energy construction for, this will be my eighth year actually. I've done over 350 documented uh, projects in public and pri public and the private sector, and I'm responsible for business development. Um, outside of, uh, I guess it's just a side note, I do have a connection to Wisconsin Rapids uh, Public Schools. I was lucky enough to wrestle Justin Tritz in 1996, and I kept, I kept my shoes on for all three periods. <laughs> so, and then uh, Dave is our engineering manager uh, for all of Wisconsin, so he oversees our technical, um, the technical portion of our business and has been around for, for quite a while in this business. And then Chuck Geary is a, a new member uh, of our team. Chuck is actually a former customer of Honeywell. We did a performance contract with him when he was uh, the superintendent at Broadhead Schools, and he really speaks well to, um, to the finance portion of uh, what you know, schools are concerned about. Here's our agenda for uh, you know, for this short presentation. Just an overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, today's objective and potential outcomes. Uh, Chuck will be talking about the enabling legislation, the development process, and then Dave will be talking about the results of the, um, our preliminary analysis, including the potential range of energy savings. Uh, then I'll I'll jump back in and talk about funding sources, the savings model, an example project, um, and why Honeywell. Uh, then a potential project timeline, and then a question and answer, uh, question and answer session for any of the board members. Uh, company highlights. Uh, you know, we are part of Honeywell International, a Fortune 100 company. Very uh, financially secure uh, organization. Uh, we are a professional services firm and energy services company. And as uh, Ed alluded to, what an ESCO is, um, it's really a procurement vehicle for school districts. Uh, we have to guarantee the energy savings over the term of the project. So between typical finance uh, projects like Pittsville, for example, is, is a new customer of ours, uh, they finance for 15 years. Uh, Wisconsin Dells that I'm working with, they're more comfortable with five, but the law says up to 20 years. Uh, we also provide uh, comprehensive infrastructure planning, including funding strategies, capital planning, project development. 
Uh, we do have an extensive knowledge, uh, you know, of uh, education, finance, and legal and administrative matters. And we've been doing this um, in Wisconsin for over 30 years, and we've done over 100 districts um, throughout the Midwest, so Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, uh, North and South Dakota. We have uh, offices in Depeer, uh, which is where I office, Madison, which is where Dave is, and then uh, our controls folks who have been working with the district for a while actually come out of Milwaukee. Uh, today's objective, explore a relationship or simply disengage. And right now, as you, as you have, uh, besides the PowerPoint, you do have a copy of our preliminary report. Uh, we've identified between $100,000 and $200,000 annually in potential savings. And also uh, some other items, um, you know, I've got to talk about the justice security things you may want to accomplish. And then also uh, some, some older facility uh, issues that have uh, just, uh, honestly, just not been able to squeeze in your budget. Uh, so the next step is to authorize a project development agreement, which really allows us to deploy our, all of our resources and uh, give you a comprehensive report. Uh, that process takes between, uh, well, for a district this size, day, what would you like say? four to six months. Four to four to six months, where our folks are going to be here, really getting, uh, really getting to know your buildings and identifying, along with Ed, um, you know, things that he wants to accomplish. So three outcomes in front of that. Um, we can uh, develop a project. Um, and if it would happen not to meet the language in our uh, project development agreement, um, which is a self-funding project, meaning that it would pay for itself through savings without doing a lot of real, uh, like large capital items. Uh, there'd be no cost to the district. We couldn't find a self-funding project. The, the, second, uh, the second outcome would be uh, you actually move forward and you implement a project, and that, that uh, development cost actually gets rolled into the project like any other any other engineer construction project. Or uh, the third, if we find a self-funding project <coughs> and the uh, district elects not to move forward, there'd be uh, a bill to the district for $42,788. And if for that $42,788, if we're charging the district that, we're actually spending quite a bit more than that. My, my development cost at Pittsville, for example, much smaller district, their entire district is half the size of Lincoln. It's 167,000 square feet, by cost were over $100,000. So we're really not in the business of going around and trying to build districts for, for doing studies. We're here to try and help the district out with its, with its uh, you know, list of expansive needs. And I'll let Chuck talk about the legislation a little bit. Let's talk about the legislation. There are two statutes that are really important um, that have created this opportunity for school districts. You want to do the slides? Yeah, next one. Um, the first one is the performance contracting statute. This actually has been around a long, long time, but it was originally designed for training programs, very specialized training programs that districts might contract out. Um, but now they have allowed it for facilities alterations and improvements as well. Um, with the, the whole goal, uh, I think it's hard to believe the legislature would do anything to help school districts in this current era. But in this, in this case, I think they do, really did intend it to help districts find ways to become more energy efficient and save money um, in recognizing that you can't do it within the revenue limits in most districts now. And so it's another vehicle, and I'll talk more about that in the next slide. As Josh said, the project can be set up so that it's self-funding. In other words, the things we identify and pursue will create enough savings to, to pay for itself over a limited amount of time. And then what he didn't mention is those savings continue on even after the project pays for itself. If you do something with, with boilers and heating systems, obviously, it's going to save you money after the loan is paid off. Um, as far as funding, you've got the regular options that you have for almost any other project. If you are a wealthy district, have room within the revenue caps, you can go ahead and pay for it out of your yearly budget. I don't know of many districts in the state that can do that. I know Broadhead, and we certainly didn't. Um, you can also, if you have a very healthy fund balance, just choose to spend some of your fund balance and pay, pay cash for it and be done with it. Um, and that fits within the statute. Most districts, depending on the size of your project, are going to want to borrow money to do it. And I'll talk more about the requirements of that on the next slide. As Josh said, your term can be up to 20 years. Most districts choose to, to fund it for less time than that so you don't have as much time commitment. Next slide. Um, the new performance contracting for the revenue limit purposes um, was just passed actually five years ago, and that's why it's very new. And honestly, that's why I'm, I've gotten involved in Honeywell. I'm a retired superintendent now. I can be really picky about what I do with my time from here on out. And when Honey call, Honeywell called and asked if I wanted to do this, I got involved because I really believe, it, believe in what Honeywell is doing. They've got a good system, a good process, and it's creating some real opportunities for districts that as I talk to my colleagues, um, many of them around the state don't even know that this opportunity exists. And so that's my part of the Honeywell project is to helping districts understand that this opportunity is out there. 
Again, the whole intent is to help you save on energy and operational costs and do it in such a way that it can pay for itself. Um, Josh mentioned, mentioned a real key term that I want to highlight for you again. Um, the savings have to be guaranteed, and I'll talk about that in just a, a second. Um, also, um, one addition, it's the first line there mentions that it was revised in 2011. In 2011, they added security and safety issues. So you're now allowed the performance contract for those services as well. It doesn't just have to be energy and utilities. The beauty of this is that it lets you do the same things you've always done in terms of maintenance, maintenance that you used to have to fit under your revenue limits. And now you can fund it outside the revenue limit as an exemption that's allowed under state funding. Um, and then obviously that creates some relief. And I think that's what I meant the legislature was actually trying to do districts a little bit of a favor. You can make the local choice as to whether or not you want to move this outside the revenue limit and give you some relief for the revenue limits. And I'm, I'm not that familiar with Wisconsin Rapids finances yet, but I'm betting you're like every other district in the state, and that is you go through the yearly battle of this is what the revenue limit allows, and this is what we really need to spend, now how do we make the two match? It's just an ongoing battle that I call it the unsolvable puzzle. Um, the revenue limit exemption is a non-recurring exemption. That means it only lasts for the one year, but it's recurring in the sense you can do it over and over and over again. So if you borrow money for, 50, for a 15 year term, you have the exemption, the access to the exemption on a yearly basis for 15 years. And, and those two terms in the statute get kind of confusing at times. It has to be, under the new, new legislation, it has to be procured by a performance contract. Next slide. Um, so that brings us to where we're at. And, and Josh hit some of this, so I'm not going to talk about the, the whole thing. Uh, we are already under the, the preliminary building analysis. That's done. We're here to talk to you tonight about getting permission to proceed with that very comprehensive analysis. As Josh mentioned, we did it at Broadhead. Um, our district, uh, 1,200 kids, so much smaller than Wisconsin Rapids. We have three buildings. Um, that the comprehensive analysis in Broadhead came back with a binder that thick. Of, it's very comprehensive, I guess is my point. You will be amazed how much depth and detail they provide. And then the next step, when that report comes back, um, Ed will sit down with you and our group and identify the things on there. You're probably not going to want to proceed with everything on that list. But the most important thing is it's your project. You get to pick and choose from that list as to which ones are your priority. At that point, we seek board approval and proceed um, implementing the improvements, and again, the last two words are the real key piece on this slide as far as I'm con concerned. Um, we guarantee the results. If we tell you and we develop a contract and a project that says we're going to save you $100,000 a year, we have, it's not only Honeywell's policy, it's state statute, that we have to guarantee those results. So if you only save 95 and it's all benchmarked and we provide the measurements and, and it'll be verifiable by Ed and his group, um, if you only save $95,000, Honeywell has to make up the districts, the difference to the district. Yeah. Well, just so I'm clear on this, yeah. um, I understand the energy projects, but there is some payback, some, some savings there. But when you start looking at uh, security and you start looking at deferred maintenance, how does that factor into this? We're, we're allowed to exceed the revenue limit to cover those projects? Right. And there's no, okay, and we can cover those outside the revenue limit. Through borrowing right. yeah. that service. Right? Yeah. In a way that's justified is through cost avoidance as well, yeah. uh, which, okay. is, which would be part of uh, my operations and maintenance audit. So I'll go into your WUFAR data and look at the last four years to see what you've spent. And that's another way that they can justify it as well under the statute. Okay. Next slide, Josh, please. Um, the, to wrap it all up, um, a real quick overview. The, the whole intent is to work within, supplement, and complement your strategic planning, uh, and we've worked with, with Wisconsin Rapids long enough to know you guys do a good job. Um, it has a very good plan for where you're headed in facilities improvements, what needs to be done. Our goal is to work with you to, to improve on that, especially in the area of energy savings. Um, in the process, it reduce your costs. Um, the savings are guaranteed. Uh, eliminates the Band-Aid approach. So many districts um, that I work with and that I've talked to, and Broadhead was a little bit guilty of this, um, you wait to see what you have left at the end of the year. At the end of the year, 
Um, okay, we've got $150,000 that wasn't designated. Um, what can we <coughs> spend it on to fix up the buildings? And you do it one year at a time, and that's not a real efficient way of doing it. So this provides some more uh, stable long-term planning and funding. And last thing, um, we will help you with the funding of it, whether it's, you know, and, and obviously you've got a very experienced business manager, he's probably got a plan for this already, um, or we wouldn't be this far along in the process talking to you, but um, whatever we need to do in terms of helping you with uh, the borrowing council, if you decide to go that route, um, we can also work with you in identifying grants and rebates. Uh, you saw one of those on your bills tonight. Um, Focus on Energy has more of those out there, and we will definitely <coughs> build as many of those into the project as we can. Um, as uh, Ed had mentioned, um, we did a preliminary analysis of all the schools in your district. Uh, we had two of our engineers, they spent a day and a half, two days going through all the facilities. Um, uh, we also collected all your um, utility expenses, gas, electric, water, and sewer, and analyzed that. Um, so, we have a lot more findings than this, I just want to keep it real general. Um, we identified a real opportunity to, re to, to save energy, reduce your cost in lighting systems. Um, Ed, you know, has done some things um, here and there, and as he eloquently said, is, you know, on his own, through his own operating budget, he can do a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. With this approach, we can do everything within the district and really get your lighting systems working at peak performance. Uh, today's technology, LED, high performance fluorescent uh, fixtures, and some of the lighting standards have changed over the last few years where they've actually determined that younger um, children need a lot less light and actually can operate better with uh, lower light levels than we've been designing for for the last 50 years. So. Um, we really see an opportunity to really improve your light quality, your energy efficiency, or your lighting systems throughout the district. Um, some of the other items, this would be top right corner. Um, you do have some, some relatively old systems. You've got some old buildings, and within those buildings, you've got some older steam heating systems, some older boilers, and this approach really gives a good method to, to really upgrade some of those heavy mechanical systems. They typically don't pay for themselves over a 10 or a 15 year period, but that's where the uh, revenue limit exemption can come in. We can get that some energy savings, make the buildings much more efficient, and then the revenue limit exemption can help you pay for those improvements that in time are gonna have to be done somehow, some way within your facilities, you know, probably through a, a referendum down the road somewhere. Um, you have done I know when we did our tour in the, you know, seven, eight, ten years ago, you did some major modifications. A lot of your elementary schools had newer hot water, high efficiency heating systems. Um, that was great. Um, so this is another tool to, to help upgrade some of your other uh, systems. Bottom left-hand corner, you still have a lot of older um, pneumatic temperature control systems. Um, I know Honeywell has been in the district for... 20, 30 years, gradually upgrading to, to newer technology. The, the newest technology today is, is electronic, digital, temperature control systems. Um, you still have a lot of the old pneumatic, which operates on air pressure, believe it or not. Um, it's technology from 50 years ago. Um, uh, our engineers said it, a lot of it is still in, in decent working condition, but to be able to migrate to uh, a much more efficient, uh, more robust control system. Um, again, this is a perfect vehicle to do that. Um, and then we mentioned security and safety. You know, definitely a top priority within school districts today. To you know, the secure entrances and security and you know, badging, uh, key fobbing. I mean, all of that can um, be looked at uh, through this approach. Um, so um, you know, we're pretty excited to. Um, to be able to uh, potentially help out the district. Um, this is just a snapshot of your utility costs that we analyzed. You're up on the top top there. You're at uh, 90 cents per square foot of total utility costs through your districts. Really, your, your, your three big schools, the uh, Lincoln High and the two junior highs, use the most energy, probably no, uh, no surprise there. Um, but 
benchmark to the state average, which is the second bar, and a bunch of the other school districts that we've analyzed, you're actually doing pretty well. So I applaud you for that. Um, I would imagine that nice Honeywell control system is controlling things very efficiently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except for today. Except for today. Well, we're talking about energy. energy. <laughs> but um, ultimately, we think we can take that 90 cents and take that down to 80 cents, maybe 75 cents per square foot. That's a down. little shoot, Billy. <laughs> they, they happen to have a, um, just a fanatical almost obsessed buildings and grounds guy. He just went to actually Oshkosh schools. <laughs> guys like that are running Air Force bases. If you mention Jim Potts, he'd almost laugh. It's, he, he thinks it's a Fortune 500 company. He's a, he's a great guy. So that's, that's the, that, they're really the gold standard. When, so when we actually did our prelim, we, we walked in and you know, we did the utility analysis and we're like, we can't help you. I mean, this is, this is it. All the mechanical was upgraded. We're like, have a nice day. So yeah. that's a good question though. Uh, basically, the, the blue bar there on the left is what you're currently spending in utilities, over a million dollars. As I said, we think we can get you to, you know, conservatively, and it all depends on, you know, how much we include in the bundle of projects, but we think we could drop you, know, as Josh said previously, um, save a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars in utility costs. Um, and this is just kind of a picture of what happens over time. Um, up on the top, that arrow that's going down, you know, when, you know, as your buildings age, as your HVAC equipment age, as different systems become obsolete, pneumatic controls becomes obsolete, your efficiency of your overall building, energy-wise, is dropping. And I'm sure you're very familiar with the arrow going up on the bottom is you have increasing pressures on your budgets, obviously, um, with the, the lack of capital capital funds and the uh, revenue cap. So, I mean, that's that's the pinch that a lot of school districts are in. I mean, you're, you're obviously uh, probably doing better than, than most districts, um, but it just eventually squeezes you and, and something has to be done. So this gives a, a, a tool that you can use to uh, take a step to upgrade some of your facilities and equipment <coughs> and really get your uh, schools operating as, as efficiently, as uh, safe safe as uh, uh, can be. So I think that's my last slide. Yeah. 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 And then just talking about funding sources, um, you know, really the bottom right hand corner is, is really pertinent to Wisconsin. You know, grants, uh, like your focus on energy stuff, alternative funding, really what that is is, is, is strictly Act 32, or a referendum if you wanted to do that to get some of these things done. But uh, Using the energy efficiency revenue limit exemption or a referendum, or how these projects get, uh, you know, can get done, or open enrollment. You know, and you guys were talking about it tonight. If you have more students coming in, obviously, you know, that, that's more money from the state and state aid. Uh, this is just a visual of what the of what it looks like for during and after the project. Right now, you've got your existing million dollar energy spend or so. Um, and then during the project, what we typically like to do if we implement a project is take the low-hanging fruit first and implement those projects as soon as we can so you start saving faster. Uh, my background, prior to coming to Honeywell, I worked for a large electrical contract and I did mostly lighting. And you know, just looking at walking through your buildings with our engineers, uh, you pr you're probably looking at a you know, million plus dollar lighting project with about between eighty and ninety thousand dollars just in lighting savings. So I mean, you, it, you know, the sooner you implement that, the sooner you're saving. And then after when we start to measure and verify, that's how your buildings will look like when they operate. All that excess savings uh, until the notes paid off, and then you'll be realizing those savings for the duration um, of that system, and then keep on down the road. And really, what you're doing is you're putting money back in the classroom. You know, and that's why, and that's why the board's here. That's why these, that's why these schools are here. This is just an example project. We picked five million dollars. It was on the higher range of our prelim, uh, preliminary report. I think we uh, identified between one point seven and uh, just over six million dollars. You know, on that project, it, it could get a lot bigger if you guys wanted to do parking lots or a bunch of security. But that's going to be up to you in the long run. But we picked five million dollars and one hundred fifty thousand dollars in energy savings just to show you what it would look like. Um, you know, for an, in addition to your mill rate, so about thirteen cents on top of your current mill rate. And so we've got our utility savings on the left, the revenue limit exemption year over year that you'd be loving um, your uh, electors for. Uh, so that we, we count that as additional revenue or savings. And then uh, when, it, uh, when the act changed from, uh, from 2009 to 2011, now the energy savings has to go back to pay the levy. So it's, it's a guaranteed, uh, you know, uh, 
guaranteed savings for the district, and it's, it's a really uh, a good thing for the taxpayers because they can see the savings coming back to pay that levy back. And this is, again, just another, uh, another uh, graph talking about that same potentially $5 million project. Uh, we have uh, an increase of $11.30 on a $100,000 home with 44% of the project being paid you know, by, by energy savings. You know, why Honeywell? Um, you know, Honeywell has uh, uh, been in Wisconsin uh, since 1992. And actually, when I was talking to Dale Hanneman, who's the service tech for Honeywell that uh, offices here and um, you know, works with Ed all the time, our relationship with this district actually started by a performance contract in 1986, when I, when I was actually in second grade. So, um, and Dale happens to be a, a 1977 graduate of Wisconsin Rapids. Uh, um, public schools, but we've been working with the district for over 40 years. You guys have had our controls in here for quite a long time, and we also have a you know long-standing relationships with and project experience with uh, local construction companies. You know, Tweet Care has got a shop here mm -hmm. over by Ed's office in the industrial park. Uh, we do a lot of project work with them. They've got 100 employees that are um, that are there consistently, and up to 150 depending on what they're doing in the mills. Uh, Faith Technologies has an office in Plover. Uh, they've got 14. I gave them a call. They got 14 folks actually in the district here uh, that work for them. And then Current Technologies, which is another electrical contractor that uh, our branch works with a lot. They have 27 employees here locally. Uh, and these are some recent uh, schools that we've worked with uh, for Act 32, Luxembourg, Casco, Gillette, and Pittsville being the, the two most recent. We're going to be starting in Pittsville, uh, in, uh, actually the construction portion in February. And Gillette, we have our kickoff meeting this Thursday. But uh, Kakana School, we did uh, just wrap that up this year. Shorewood and then Point Net as well. When we're talking about these ranges, like that, uh, uh, again, like uh, Chuck had mentioned, you're not going to want to do everything that we identify, but that's part of the, you know, the fee, the service. Uh, the, the range of projects at Pittsville was $700,000 up to 5.2, and their board was comfortable with 2.5 million. That's what they thought they could get through the electors and, and really and, and still uh, still go to fish fries on a Friday and not get an equal look. Uh, you know, potential timeline, uh, we've talked about the concept introduction, uh, which is really, you know, uh, my folks talking to Ed and, and Dan since July. We did our preliminary analysis and we looked at the report. You know, here we are tonight, um, you know, asking for board approval for a project development agreement, or if you table it, maybe uh, we'll, we'll see it, uh, uh, see it come back on the agenda for the February meeting. The comprehensive analysis, we think we could get it done uh, starting in February and have it wrapped up by May. Uh, board consultation and scope selection. This is this would be workshops, very similar to what we're doing right now, talking about prioritizing need. You know what's important to the district, um, and, and what do you guys want to do? And that that would fall in the, the May June time frame. Then board approval for the final project, and then then there will be a bunch of uh, legalese things to do, passing passing the revenue uh, limit exemption resolution prior to the end of the levy period, then a bond sale, and then design and implementation. I want to know how you do this. Yeah, it should be. It should be after 2016. But, uh, appreciate that. I changed it. I must not have saved it. So I thought you might have had a time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then, just recalling today's objective, you know, forge a relationship um, or simply disengage. And that's really all I have. If uh, does the board have any questions? I do. I I'm noticing that everything is being described in the savings and number of dollars, and I'm just concerned that. We've talked about this before that the district saves money on energy and then the energy bills go up, the prices go up. So if you're measuring it in actual dollar savings or in actual energy use, how are to guarantee that savings? Yeah, our guarantee is actually energy use. But then we apply the, in order to change it into dollars, we apply the existing rates. And you're right, I mean, energy rates they're not going down anytime soon. I mean, they will continue to go up. So really, you know, the more we save, your cost avoidance gets bigger and bigger as the rates go up. So it's, it's um, but you're right when you look at just your budget, if your rates, if you save 20%, but your rates go up 10%, the dollar savings isn't there. But if you, if you would have done nothing, your would have went up considerably more. One of my mentors in this, uh, lacrosse district has a, a person just, he's an energy manager, that's all he does. He spent 35 years as a custodian, he noticed a lot of stuff, you know, dripping faucets, things like that that cost district money. And he just kept, you know, bringing this stuff before his board and 
you know, this stuff really bothered him. He's like, these are dollars that are just being wasted. You know, nobody's getting anything for them. And, you know, I, I call him quite often, get his perspective on things. And, you know, he said, you know, basic line is we can't do anything about the cost of, of utilities. The only thing we can control is the amount we use. And that's kind of what the business these guys are in. Um, reducing our use. You know, we can't control costs. You know, waterworks and lighting set the cost. You know, they have their profit margin, things like that. All we can affect is, is how we use the buildings and the amount of utilities that we use while we're in them. And I, I think Josh brought it up one, one other time. You can have two identical schools and they'll have really different utility costs just based on the use. You know, we have, we have some schools that, that use a lot more utilities than others. You know, we're at the 90 cents um, throughout our district because of um, the Rapid School District being proactive and, and you know, thanks to your guidance and, and my predecessor, Tom Helgus, that our buildings are in pretty good shape, but we can improve. You know, we can, we want to stay on that cutting edge, I think, as far as, especially energy. You know, that $100,000 that, that we could potentially save every year, you know, that keeps going after the project's paid for. But this also allows us to do now with safety and in, in that yep. parking lot repairs and stuff like that where in a lot of it I, I just read about the Lacusa project for fourteen million dollars mm -hmm. in which they're gonna do a lot of stuff that they haven't been able to do for ten years, which right. if one of those boilers goes at Lincoln, you know, mm -hmm. if it goes, we need to replace it. So that money's mm -hmm. coming right out of general fund no matter how we do it, mm -hmm. because we need to do it now. So I mean those are the things that we can try to avoid that we don't have that major catastrophe that has to take general fund dollars um, or stuff that we don't want to be spending that kind of money on. And that type of thing that we can be proactive in, in helping. I think the other part of Act 32 came around when they started messing around with Fund 80 mm -hmm. and, and before they, you know, the legislator got involved with that, which gave us some flexibility with repairs and that type of thing, but we don't have that anymore either with where they've. So I'm I have just a, go ahead. Uncle. Well, I was going to say you have five million listed for energy savings. If we tack on any, um, we have five million dollars for uh, example project size. The range of savings is a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand annually. But that that five million was really only if we were looking at those energy projects. That was just an example, um, just to show you the the potential financial effect on the taxpayers. Uh, just. Uh, again, just as an example project to, okay. to, to show you, I get, when when we actually, if if you decide to you know move forward and hire us, uh, we'll be in real time checking uh, you know checking things on a facility improvement matrix. You'll be selecting projects, and it'll have uh, turnkey project cost, annual savings, and then you'll be able to see w uh, how much you're saving and and how much the project will cost because there'll be a wide range of things that um, you know, you'll be able to select from. Probably won't select them all. Okay. And there needs to be a public hearing prior to? Uh, the, uh, public hearing prior to, uh, the, the way that the statute reads is once you pass the initial uh, revenue limit exemption resolution, there's a 30-day petition period uh, where there is a public meeting held over that 30 days for the public to, you know, to come in and you know, find, out about, uh, find out about the project. I, I have the preference, and we did this at Pittsville and Gillette recently, where even before we pass the initial resolution, I'd like to have a, an optional public meeting for, you know, so people know, before, before you just pass a resolution for $14 million or what have you, know uh, you're educating the public and they know what they're getting for that, for that $5 million and why are you doing it. And in both instances, there was uh, overwhelming buy-in from, from the constituents. Where you know when you talk about like a Jill, you talk about a 1927 air handling unit and poor indoor air quality, you know, and all of these things that really are, are drivers besides energy savings. People tend to really empathize with that because you're doing the right thing up front by letting them know why you're doing it and how you're doing it. So, my house, if we were to reduce our electricity and other energy purposes, we would have to educate ourselves on how to do it. Are any of your projects educating? The district employees and people that come in, you know, this is how you save energy. That, that is a service that we offer, um, and where it's a, a comprehensive course, and it really tries to change the culture and the behaviors in the district. 
and it's something we can offer if that's what the board is interested in. Again, that comes down to scope selection. You know, what do you want to hire us for? What do you want us to do? Because at the end of the day, it's really the district's project, it, and, it, and the board deciding along with Ed and Ed and Dan's recommendations of what you want to do. We're just here to be, uh, you know, a guide uh, to give you that information. And if you want us to, to so implement you a program like that, oh yeah, oh Josh, I, if I can speak to that too, sure. I can answer that a little bit based on our experience in Broadhead. Number one, part of the goal is to try to remove some of those responsibilities from staff. Um, for example, proximity lighting controls. Um, ideally, we would like to teach all students and all staff to turn off lights when they leave the room. Reality says they don't, so you put in um, movement sensor lighting so that after a set period of time, the lights go off. Um, fixing leaking water faucets and some of those things you can control internally. And then two things that we can offer the service, and I think you'll find it very helpful, to educate staff about some of these issues but just the fact that you as a board have pursued a project like this and they see the engineers not only around doing the studies um, and then doing the work afterwards, you're going to get thousands of questions. What are these people doing? What are they in here? Well, why are we doing that? And, and that's all part of the, the informal education process that will address exactly what you're looking for. Any questions? <clears throat> I don't see any renewable energy things in there. It's, 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 it's in our preliminary report. We always include, uh, just yeah, just, just with so the, yeah. yeah. I mean, with renewable the, energy, I mean, the payback really isn't <coughs> that attractive, especially to a publicly owned entity like a school district that doesn't have access to the tax credits. Privately owned entity has 30% tax credits that they can take advantage of. Even with those a 50% subsidy on renewable energy might get you to a 15-year payback. I mean, it really, you know, does make economic sense. What some schools have chosen to do is to put it in a small solar PV and integrate that to a science curriculum. Uh, we've done that before, and even a small wind turbine. I mean, more of a, a demonstration project. What about passive heat sources, like, you know, put a black thing over here where the sun shines, you get into the winter, and then you cover it up with something like that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen solar walls that are, you know, a lot of that more applies to new construction and facilities. Tough to retrofit. But. Well, I'm thinking that we maybe should take some time in the next three weeks, four weeks to go through this. It's good information. Thank you very much for bringing it forward. But before approving it tonight, I guess I'd feel more comfortable having some time to go through this document and pick it apart a little bit and we, could put it under we can put it in the agenda for next month. Okay. So I feel that that's yeah, everyone's approval. Look at anything other than okay. our first first taste of it was last Tuesday as far as getting a general information on it and now we can report that I, it definitely I doesn't make sense to put that dates on problems. Sure. And our buildings serve a lot of students and staff. And a lot of public. <coughs> yes, there's a lot of activity in our buildings after school. Boy Scouts come to our buildings. But it's good to say that we've been doing a good job at yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, for a big district, you guys have really done a nice job. Good people. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank I'm just going to leave some of my business cards on the table. If you have any technical questions, email, phone numbers on there. Feel free, free to jump in your phone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on next to item C. Uh, Friend of Education Award recipient for 2015. I have um, got a number of, of possibilities and I talked with um, John and with Mary. And um, what we'd like to bring forward is the firefighters of uh, Wisconsin Rapids. Um, they have worked very closely with our district to um, help us out with Stuff the Bus. They have done the coats for kids in conjunction with some of our social workers and, and guidance counselors. Um, at Christmas time they do a toy project, toy collection, as well as gift cards and that type of thing. And then um, they're continuing a, cl a clothing drive for our caring closet. Um, I've spoken with Heather Wazitza and she um, has some other things in mind too that they've worked on us very closely with. So I would suggest to you that we bring them forward as friends of education. With everyone's approval? Yeah, I would move. Okay, that uh, is presented at the spring concert, winter concert on February 23rd. Yep. Is that at 7 30? 
730, yes. 730, and that's at the PAC, correct? The PAC, yeah. Do we do a motion on this? Yes, we do. I was so moved. Firefighters. Second. Okay, motion to second to approve the Wisconsin Rapids Fire Department as the Fund of Education recipient for 2015. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So we can move on to discussion and possible action regarding additional study of the Southwood County Hockey Building property use. Probably a year ago, um, I mentioned to you that uh, the Wisconsin Rapids Hockey Association was um, looking to make a revision in, in how they run the, the hockey building, and that being that they would offer, um, I think, I think Brian is just beer, beer right. sales at the hockey building. Um, part of tonight's discussion um, is really just to get a feeling from you about whether or not we should pursue um, investigating that further. Um, the hockey building, of course, came about through Southwood County 2000, some years ago, and I think maintaining that hockey building has become a costly venture, keeping the ice and, and so on. Um, and so I think they're looking for an additional revenue source. Um, I had a party approach us asking whether or not they could hold a wedding reception there, and um, I don't think they held it there because, of course, that building, while it's owned by the hockey rec building, or the hockey rec department, um, or hockey rec board, I don't know what it's called, the, what is it, what's the official name of it? The uh, Southwood County, Southwood County rec, rec Center. Rec Center. Um, I always think hockey. <laughs> There's ice skating too. I mean, figure skating. Um, they um, then approached. They had a curling. They had a curling tournament, and that would have been another venue where they would have liked to have sold alcohol. Um, as I said, the wedding reception I don't believe occurred. Now the building itself is not ours, but it's the footprint of land beneath it. So that building sits on school property. Um, at this point in time, um, Ed, you've done a title search, and there's nothing that's binding on the property there. Um, <clears throat> we've simply had some conversation with um, one of the board, one of the current, I think Jim's a current board member, is he as well? Yes, Jim, Jim Suchek, Suchek, yes. And um, Ryan is also a board member um, and sat in with me as we talked to Jim about the possibilities. So I think unless there's anything further, I just really what we're looking for is some general direction. Um, well, this, this came up, I know I did discussions, I don't think we can quite, I think we came to a business services meeting because I know about a year ago, the sports I think I marketing kind of an group update. with Ken Porter and those guys were involved with it as well. And I know one of the suggestions we had come up with then is that in their board, which would have to probably do all that legwork, was to have the city annex that property or have that property become a city property and then they could it would no longer be a school district property is that one of the alternative i think that was one of the avenues we were, we were looking at okay. because i mean i i you know I, and I you know that was one of the suggestions that was come that came up is that they would discuss with the city if the city would be willing to take over that piece of land that that i hadn't heard i you know we talked about um I did contact our, our district's attorney um, regarding this, this matter, and it sounds that, and, and again, we wouldn't pursue it. If, if, if you think selling alcohol in that venue is, is not an option at all, then we'll just stop the conversation, but if you're even... Can I clarify? I sell alcohol, but only during very specific situations, not like a school hockey game there would or not, something no, like no. that. No, it would be very similar to the like the rafters over at... at um, you know, they sell during the rafters games or the Legion games, Legion but they don't sell during high school or youth. So it would be the same. It would not be during high school or youth hockey events or um, the, the figure skating club that, that puts on a performance every day. That would be very specifically drawn out. Um, no, I lost my train of thought. Oh, the other, besides the city annexing the property, um, and speaking with our attorney, it sounds as though we could just create an MOU and not, not give up the property, um, create an MOU that would very specifically draw out those kinds of things. Um, 
you know, that would suggest, you know, we have, we have an MOU with the, the South Loop County <coughs> Hockey Organization and that, you know, we would allow, um, you know, beer sales during these events, that, that type of thing. That would be another option. Um, it is a revenue source um, for them and they feel that I think gate, you know, the gate would be... Well, who polices <coughs> what goes on then? Well, they would. That's, yeah. They would. Um, you know, our, our district's attorney, if you were to ask him for his legal opinion, he would be asking us to consider liability matters. Um, of course, we carry liability insurance. Um, but tonight, really, what I need from you is, is whether or not it's even something you would want me to dig further into. If, if you're sitting here thinking we are not in any way, shape, or form, you know, interested in, in having beer sales at that building, um, it would not be a revenue to us as a district. That's not what I'm talking about. It would be a revenue to that, that Southwood Hockey. And, and it's big, become a costly venture to keep that building up and running. And Ryan, I don't know if you have other things yeah, from yeah, there, there's a perspective. Yeah, there's a few additional details that I would add. For, first, to, to begin with, the Rec Center Board has not made a decision or taken a, a final position on whether they want to entertain or move forward with the possibility of, of selling beer at the River Kings that events. My, my question um, is, what does the board say? The, I would say this, this matter has come up for two reasons. First and foremost, because the ownership of the River Kings has requested it. Uh, they view it as something that would help support them attracting additional numbers in the way of attendance. Um, the Rec Center Board, as part of their contract with the River Kings, does, have, does re receive a portion of the proceeds of the gate when there is an event this season. And, and I would say from the Rec Center Board's perspective, just the, the agreement that they've entered into hosting the River Kings is for the purpose of, of generating revenue to help sustain the entire Rec Center operation. Um, and, and that's why, at least in, in study at this point in time, and the Rec Center Board does have a committee that's studying it. I, uh, I do also serve on that committee that has been reviewing it. Um, it it's being reviewed because it, it is viewed as being beneficial to the Rec Center in the way not only um, as a, a revenue generating source in its relationship with the River Kings, but other events uh, that could potentially take place or, or have in, in a slightly different manner. For example, there was a curling tournament held this last year um, there was an interest uh, and a request from that group to be able to sell beer during its curling tournament, which we obviously we're not able to do. If that event or an event like that were to be able to return in the future, uh, there would be an interest for something like that as well. I, I guess the final piece that I would touch upon is, is the, in discussions that the Rec Center Board has had, they, they have acknowledged and in, in would intend on, on their end to want to have written into whatever uh, arrangement may, that may be made that the sales would be limited to very specific events and those would be not anything that has to do with our WIAA team or the youth programs. I can understand the need to generate more income where they can. I mean, we want to be able to sustain that building. It's a beautiful place that could host probably many more things if they had more options. I think as Ryan indicated too, though, um, they, aren't, they aren't quite decided themselves, but it's a matter of wanting to get at least this piece, you know, settled, I think, before they proceed and, and make their final decision. And depending on how you feel about it, that could make a very short order of <laughs> right. that, further that, discussion that is, for them. But that is a part of the Rec Center Board's consideration of this, is they would like to know where, where they stand with, with the school district, school board, as far as if, if there's a possibility. And I think as Dr. Dickman is referring to, is, we're, is the administration is looking for some direction on if you have an interest in, in pursuing that possibility. In other words, you know, we'll look at it from a variety of, of we, we really are looking for action on whether or not to proceed with further study. And that further study would include um, looking at, does, you know, what, what happens if the city annexes it? What, what happens if the rec board owns the property? What happens if we maintain the property but put an MOU together? So several options that we would then bring forward to you. So the direction you want from us, so if we said, okay, we're willing to look at this, but then you come back and say, okay, this is what they want, we still can say no. Oh, there. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Keep the option open. Why not? It's it's really just to have us check into this further and go continue further down the road. It's not to have you make an ultimate decision at this point. I'm open to it. So I would just get an act on motion. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
approve their further study of, of looking into the uh, MOU for alcohol sales in a very specific event. Is that address what you're looking for? If you just want us to look at an MOU? Or would you like us to look at all options? All options, yeah. yeah. Okay. MOU and all options. Okay, so there's a motion and a second to uh, approve further study on different options for the use of the Southwood County Hockey Building property. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We just wouldn't pursue it, you know. I, I guess one of the reasons I guess it might be advantageous for us to still have some stake in is that if it gets annexed and all of a sudden becomes a, a separate, literally a, a company, and they decide they don't want to sell, have services to us for our schools. You know, that, that can be a problem for us. Well, it's also a discussion about which piece of the property and what are we currently looking at, you know, with Ron Rasmussen here in the, in the audience. Um, you know, we're certainly going to look at our whole plot of land there to see what our current, you know, we're working on our facilities right now ourselves, so we don't want to necessarily just turn that over without really further investigation. Who would instigate an annexation? Annexation. Didn't I, didn't I hear that word thrown out? I just mm -hmm. the possibility. I know we talked about it at one time that if if they could, if there was no way that the school district would feel any way, shape, or form that they'd want to have help, we'd want to be selling alcohol, that they would be able to you know petition the city to take the, the piece of land over. Okay. So that so the board, the hockey association board would have to do that. Mm -hmm. So that would, if we didn't want to. Be, Explore this further. One of their recourses would be to seek annexation. It, I, I guess I, one one detail that I would clarify from the rec center board's perspective is there, our our board has had no discussion about city ownership of that property. No. It's it's been either uh, an MOU with the district. I, the board is very much vested in a continued close relationship with the school district and the school board. So the, the, the rec center board, I, I think Ken Porter and that group may have had some conversations right. about that, John, but the rec center board is looking for either an MOU with the district or to the board to acquire, the rec center board to acquire ownership of, of the property, the ground underneath the building that it currently operates. And as far as that goes, we do have a, a city employee representative on the rec center board as well, and, and nothing has come from him in the way of uh, city involvement in this. Okay, we move on to item E, discussion and possible action on participation in an international student program. Say to all the Boy Scouts, I'm sorry, this is a much longer meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we got you here, we're going to keep really trying. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're impressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ron Rasmussen and I met, as did Kathy, with um, an, a gentleman from um, the UW College's system. His name is Tim uh, Urbonia, and he is the Director of International Education Office of Academic Affairs. And he uh, met with us regarding uh, the possibility of um, having an international student program. And essentially, it would be working with China. Um, they have been in touch with Wausau, um, I believe DC Everest, as well as Marshfield at this point in time. And it's kind of a gateway into the two year campuses, is what it is. So, a senior um, student from China uh, would come here for their senior in their senior year in high school um, and then graduate here um, they would not only have their Chinese high school diploma but also a Lincoln High School um, diploma and then the hope is that the students then continue on into the either the two-year campus or perhaps a four-year campus um, when asked why why are they interested in coming here um, what we were informed um, of was that there was a feeling that education in high school is lacking. Um, they don't get the critical thinking that our students do, and they would like their students to be exposed to that. Um, they would also like the bilingual experience, and I think they feel that the earlier they get in, you know, to learn to actually speak that English language, the better for them. Um, I think they come with English already in hand. Um, they will take uh, an exam to determine what their level is. 
and essentially then they come for their senior year and they, and they want the diploma. Um, primarily um, wealthy families that are, are paying the, the tuition. They pay um, whatever we set up as, as charging um, per student. So it would be their tuition, they would have living expenses that we would charge them for. Um, in, a, in other words, if John said, well, yes, we'll sponsor one for, you know, a child for a year, um, he would have a monthly stipend that would, would be paid to house the child. Um, so there are a variety of, of things. Um, Ron, I don't know if you want to step in and add anything to that. It's just kind of an overview. Yeah, um, I don't have a lot to add other than um, I do have a friend of mine who operates a Chinese exchange program who's a principal in Nebraska. And I talked to him and their international coordinator today. Um, as Dr. Dickman said, we would guarantee a certain English score. It's called a TOEFL exam um, in order to accept students. Um, I asked what the we'd positives. Have, we'd have to determine that. We'd determine what whatever the benchmark be, is. Because different districts have different benchmarks. Yeah. Uh, I asked uh, them what their positives have been. They're a high school of about 500, and currently this academic year they have 19 students from China um, in, in their high school. Um, positives is they're really driven to succeed. Um, in Chinese culture, family academic success equals family success, and so they're really driven to succeed. Uh, independent, very self-disciplined. Um, Negative is we sometimes you have to drag them to extracurricular and co-curricular events because it's not part of their traditional Chinese culture. Many times, Chinese high school, they go to live in a boarding school or a dormitory away from their family, and other than that's where they attend school. So the environment of coming to America and relationship building and that importance of that other environment, social. that social interactions is an area that they really work on in Omaha uh, for their students. Um, as Dr. Dickman said, um, you build in tuition, your visa fees, etc. cetera. Uh, the program you become, the school district would become the granting agency for an F visa, um, which is um, really, we become the exchange agency. Uh, so unlike Ro Noon Rotary or other organizations um, that supply us for an exchange students, uh, they come on J visas and that agency becomes a granting agency and there's no need for that student to earn a diploma. The difference is we become the granting agency uh, working with the Department of Homeland Security and we will guarantee a diploma on, a, on an F visa. How do we guarantee a diploma if somebody's come to our school for one year? We get a Chinese transcript uh, from the Chinese schools and we have that they send that to us in Chinese and in English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then we interpret it. Um, I think in your board background is an article from Janesville. Um, I believe they have 80 students this year between Janesville, Parker, and Craig um, in a very similar program, 3W Rock County. Um, the students we're receiving are generally very high academic achieving students and uh, from, my, from my conversations, with limited conversations with people uh, and that's when you look at the diploma. Obviously they have to have success here in order to get their grades, etc. Uh, Omaha so my friend there in Omaha, they've run the program for nine years. They've had one student not be a success. And they started out with two, and they're at 19 this year. And they, their goal is to be, they'll be at 35 at some point. We have students who transfer in their senior year from, you know, their yeah, state you know, side. I just, you kind of get tired of hearing about how everyone's complaining about our American school systems and how horrible our schools are and we should do it like they do in China, yet China can't wait to send their students here, you know? That's right. I think, we, I think we had a similar conversation uh, after our meeting with UW system. Uh, they have looked at, um, UW Marshall um, is looking at partnering with Marshall High School and us. Uh, UW Marathon with Wassa East, Wassa West, and DC Everest. Uh, UW Fox Valley with the Appleton School District and UW Fond du Lac with Fond du Lac School District is my understanding at this point. So it's a two-year school then? Two-year schools. Uh, primarily it is seen as, uh, they're hoping obviously that they come here and they go to UW Marshall. There's, they don't need to. Um, but if they are successful with us, go to UW Marshall, are successful there, they automatically trans can transfer to UW Madison. Mm -hmm. Or any other school? Or any other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, or any other school, okay. but many times it is seen as Madison being the well, engineering. Yeah, Madison. Uh, in our perspective, is they don't count on our student enrollment. We bill 
the family for all costs that we have associated with attending school here at, at Lincoln. Is it a lot more uh, to administer the program? Uh, it depends on how big we get, to be honest. Larry, uh, we can build into our tuition the cost for us to administer the program. So for looking at hiring additional time for staff to, to, to oversee the program, that is built into the tuition um, that those students that we have. Obviously, you look at cultural experiences for students, any of that, that would all be part of whoever we would maintain. I think our, my intent would be, if we did this, would be take two, three students to start it out with. We um, last week. <laughs> uh, talk, talking, talking to the um, my friends in Omaha is they would they would they like that small number because it it, it uh, forces socialization. Right. Whereas when they now they're at 19, they're looking at 35. Sometimes it doesn't happen right. exactly. um, as much, and they they really are working through that right now. Uh, it's new to all of us. Um, and, well, um, I know some districts are using this as a the revenue source. Yeah. Um, I think Janesville is bringing in about $2 million. $2 million, I think when we did the math. I mean, for our, if we took two or three students, we're not looking at adding additional staff and, yeah. into, our, into our system uh, to supplement those. Now, for taking 80, we would be. Yeah. Um, but initially, starting off, it's two. And they would select us also. There'd be an, there's a lot of schools around the United States that do this. Green Lake is, um, is it Berlin or Green Lake, very near us? Has been, they uh, they have a dormitory where they house their students. Oh, that's uh, uh, but the UW system is really looking at partnering with select high schools at select two-year campuses right now uh, to see uh, where this is going. Is um, Dr. Dickman said I think uh, the gentleman we met with the UW system, his wife currently is a principal in China at, at a school there. I think Assumption either has Chinese students this year or they've had them. them in the past. They still, they do. Have they still do. They're here multiple years. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing a similar thing in, in Milwaukee in the uh, Catholic schools. And there they actually have, instead of kids being housed with families, they have them living in hotels they've converted into, mm -hmm. because so many of these kids are in boarding schools, that they're used to that kind of, of living. But they're there multiple years. Mm -hmm. That's not what this program is. I asked that same question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't remember how many years ago we had a big discussion about limiting the number of foreign exchange students that we wanted at Lincoln. Has that policy uh, opened up? Are we still looking at a certain number? Would this have any influence on that? Since I became principal, the limit is 10. Mm -hmm. and, uh, since I became principal, we have not reached 10. Mm -hmm. uh, we have allowed agencies more than three, just because we have not hit that, that and number. And it's going to be the JVs and not the F. Yeah, and that's a different visa Part. And I mean, if you come in the Commons, you see the, the flags of the mm -hmm. foreign exchange students we've had last year and this year from which country. Uh, I think this year we have five, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, why is Marshfield wanting to include us? You know, Marshfield? Yeah. Uh, I think that's just a continuation of our partnership. We've been working with them oh, for um, the just with the course option, with, oh, okay. our, with our dual enrollment courses. Oh, okay. We, they also run a, uh, there's a U for U program, so they're in our building every Tuesday <coughs> from 2.15 to 2.50 to work with students on post-secondary planning. Um, they've really reached out to us to, to really look at that transition for students post-high school, what that may mean. And obviously it means that if they now have a dorm on campus, so there may be more students from, from Rapids that may go live there. And okay. we know the expense of college at this point. So they've reached out to us. Uh, they view us and I think Marshall High School as two high schools they feel we could partner with to start to start the program up. Do they have? Did you ask your friend about? Yeah. Um, is there ever been a problem with the Chinese parents not paying? No, uh, you're, you, you take your money up front. Oh, okay. Uh, to to guarantee payment into the program and uh, and I believe Janesville I think was, they have a first semester it's due by this point and then the second semester and uh, they have the same. Uh, at Omaha, you have a certain, I think that in Omaha they pay two-thirds of it up front. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if it does not work out, you maintain that tuition. The family does not get it back. Okay. Um, but I said they've only had one student in their eight years that hit. And that student wanted to go back home, mm -hmm. is what they said. Well, we yeah. asked that question too, you know, if there's homesickness, that type of thing. Because mm -hmm. it's a whole year. Mm -hmm. And um, the well, gentleman who spoke to us said a lot of these kids are already in boarding school, so their homesickness isn't... We've already worked through that. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not trying to cast aspersions on Chinese oh, yeah. parents. I'm just wondering if 
it's kind of hard to send a bill collector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I think in Janesville timeline, and I have not spoken with anyone at Janesville, uh, there's a certain time frame before the school district will issue the visa to them that the payment has to come oh, before okay. the school district will okay. issue the visa. Uh, there is an upfront cost to administer the program. We, we have to get approved by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, there's an application fee and then a, a site visit to guarantee. Uh, that's about $2,300 uh, that we would build in. Uh, into the tuition uh, to become an F-granting uh, institution. Kind of ironically, we had some of this discussion internally earlier this summer because due to the River Kings, they, was, they were looking at bringing a, a, junior, a recruit from Russia uh, to attend school, but we were not a, uh, an F-granting uh, high school uh, at that point. You can go on, there's a lot, there's probably, I'm guessing, 40, 50 public high schools in the state that are currently F granting visas that have been approved by the Department of Homeland Security. So we could be recruiting our own faculty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So ballpark figure, what's the kidding. tuition then in American Dow? Uh, I think it varies. I, I think uh, Dr. Dickman in, uh, supplied with you Janesville's. There's $14,000 for tuition, uh, $10,000 for room and board, and mm -hmm. if you add up all the other Incidental yeah, cost is about five. Oh, she is not in there. Uh, there's about five thousand dollars that you figure for travel, for your visas, personal expenses, etc. Uh, they're on the higher end, from my it's understanding. About twenty-seven nine. Uh, twenty-seven nine um, is uh, Janesville. Uh, in Omaha, right? I think there's ends up, ends up to about twenty-three thousand. Uh, and I think it's just it's just our quick overview of it and obviously if we're looking at I, similar to Wasa does decide to move ahead with the program or Marshall decides there was an article in the Marshall paper uh, really stating that they're moving ahead Marshall High School is moving ahead with it that we'd probably be in a similar tuition area um, than the schools in Wasa because the families will also select you right. uh, based upon your academic background and what you are as an institution because they want to make sure because academic success equals family success that so they also will sort of look at you and say all right are you the institution that we want our our mm -hmm. student to attend and you can do interviews um, Skype or FaceTime interviews with the families and the students <coughs> uh, to attempt to guarantee a fit I think we'd benefit from the diversity that they could provide for our community and our students and uh, I'd be I'd be approved I would like to do the program do we need a motion <laughs> we do I would move so second <laughs> <laughs> motion the second to approve participation in the international student program okay. okay all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries Thank you for the additional work. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for it. <laughs> okay, last item on our agenda is action on the 2015 Wisconsin Association of School Board Resolution. We uh, got those last week in our packet. Um, I guess what I'm asking for is just uh, as normal uh, your, your approval to uh, vote as represent the board in the vote of the resolutions at the part of the committee next week, you know, sometime next week. Um, I sent this out in approval. Most of them are, you know, the first one is creation of school districts, uh, which basically just about everything here is in relation to some sort of state law or something that we've done. Take, trying to take an, again attack on the public education basically uh, so what this is is a, a, a process and a lot of it some of its underlined and some of it's already been approved but the, <coughs> the first one is uh, that basically the majority of the voters with a referendum are able to vote on whether you merge or don't merge or if you are forced to do something uh, that both districts must approve it um, that was the first one the um, on that can you when you Get down there. Can you ask what they mean by significant percentages? You know, it says significant percentages of 11th and 12th graders. What is significant percentages? She's on the second one. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Oh, I'm not there yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have no problem with number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the second one and basically the second and the third and the second and the third both deal with uh, the, the, the September one start date. Um, I did have a question about that too, as far as what. You know, please give me a quantification of what a significant percentage would be. Um, the first one deals with the AP, AP and IB um, international baccalaureate. Do we do that? No. No. I didn't think we did. So it would, in our case, it would be if it would affect us, it would be through the AP. Um, but I did, you know, did have that in my mind as far as what a significant percentage is, because that to me, to me, significant percentage would have to be, you know, 35, 40, 50 percent. Not a, not a 20%, so I don't know what that really means. Well, it's, it's 75% well, for the ID for the International yeah. Baccalaureate. But they want, to treat a, they want to treat AP on par with that, it right. looks like. And then the second part of that, or the next revolution, has to do with uh, uh, start date waivers with the um, parochial schools along with the uh, public transportation. Um, but a lot of that is that one of the caveats on that is, is that you have to have the same bus routes, which we do not. We have dual bus routes. Right, we don't do K-12 all at once. Right. So I don't know how that would affect us either, but that's, you know, they're just trying to find ways to, so that we can, the DPI opens up since the, the legislature doesn't seem to want to act on changing the uh, current law. Uh, the second one John, is on that one, though, you know, they're talking about transportation. If we have parochial schools that get voucher money and they can start before September 1st, we as a public school are at a disadvantage because there's some parents that want their kids to start earlier and finish earlier. And I just think, you know, that if you have private schools or voucher schools that are getting public money and they have an earlier start date, then the public school should be able to do that too. And, you know, it, doesn't, it isn't based on transportation. I mean, it just has to be a, a level field. Uh, resolution 15.4 is technical education teacher shortage, and that deals with uh, relaxing the licensures and, and being able to get the licensures while you're uh, um, working towards your degree to make that. Uh, and that is a big place, a big, big issue. I mean, that's. Especially in uh, the uh, eastern part of the state, where they're uh, kind of poaching from each other and getting into the future. Um, anybody have any issues on or questions on that one? Uh, Fifteen five state funding and flexibility for course option pro uh, program. Um, basically, they're just asking that the state legislature continue to fund it. You know, right now, they say they are, but we know how that works out. Um, then 15.6 kind of dovetails with that as far as the coordination, which I'm still confused about youth options and not fourth <laughs> options. I don't know how you have two different separate, almost competing and conflicting programs, but um, um, the coordination of between the two is so that they are more streamlined and we don't have to have, um, or, or, and, and, and part of that is to give us as school districts a chance to offer that course so that we don't have to pay that money to send them outside of the district. Well, it also supports reasonable limitation on um, their opportunities to go outside of yeah. the secondary. And that would be probably so that they aren't taking 15 credits at a college on a long time. 15-7 um, is open enrollment, and this is the one where the area talked about it earlier, where they want to, again, close the window uh, so it begins on the first Monday in February and ends on the second Friday in March. And that again is for being able to staff and know who you've got and, and staff so that you can get that done for your budget process, which has to be done within a couple months after that. Um, 15 8, open enrollment decision under an alternate application process. Um, That's basically so requiring open enrollment applicants submitted outside by the statutory window be subject to sole approval by the school board of the resident district. Um, that's what they're looking for there. 15.9, uh, modify out-of-state tuition payments statute, which, I mean, that doesn't really apply to us. 15.10, um, 
boundary appeal for board decisions, which we kind of hit some of those right with our recent policy changes. Um, this one's considering appeals arising from the tuition pay payment statute. And then 1511 is rehiring Wisconsin Retirement System retirees. And um, what it is kind of looking at is re, uh, recreating or refilling and recreating existing resolution 4.37, which has already been proposed before uh, to deal with um, more or less, it's going to deal with the um, Health Care Acts. But it's, it wants to be supporting legislation that would allow a person who is receiving Wisconsin Retirement System uh, annuity to be rehired in a WRS participant in employment after at least a 60-day break between terminating employment and returning uh, as a teacher and restore to such rehired employees the option to continue receiving their WRS annuity but not accrue any new WRS Con, uh, contributions or credits. So basically, we could hire a retired teacher as long as they're willing to work out for their retirement for their benefits and they're not getting new benefits. I have a little problem with this. Um, you know, you, you've got the people working that are putting into the Wisconsin retirement system. And if you're hiring retirees that are no longer putting into that system, then you have how many people no longer contributing to that system? where people that, you know, five, ten years from now are going to retire, there won't be enough people contributing to it. Um, you know, I'm just not, you know, if they wanted to rehire them and then make them contribute to the system again. But I, you know, I have a problem with not, you know, keeping their pension, working in a job where they're not going to be, they're getting a salary and they're not going to be putting into the retirement system. Uh, you can, you know, you can see the system being eroded. So I don't know if there's any clarification, if there'll be discussion on that, but I that's a problem the, I have with I it. I think the, the rationale is that they're trying to find uh, qualified teachers in certain areas, and that's why the rationale is, is that there's, and tech ed's one of them, and, and so that these teachers can come back. Right. But my rationale is you've got to keep the retirement yeah. system solvent, and I don't think this helps keep it solvent. Thoughts on that one? Because I didn't, I didn't have a. That was. I'm interested one of my to hear the discussion. I don't that. know what their rationale, and that was one of my questions: is, is who's this benefiting? Mm -hmm. um, 1512 is one I have a problem with. It's the repeal of Populous County's teacher tenure statute, which basically is just Milwaukee County. Um, I have a problem that they're bringing this forward to the whole state. Um, I don't know if there's any other thoughts on this, but um, basically it's a, a law, a statute by the state regarding tenure that they fought to get at the time to retain teachers. And then I'm sure this is before, I'm not sure the history of this, but I'm guessing this is done about the time we were going to vulture schools down there and, and trying to break up the funds for the public education in Milwaukee. But, um, I really have a problem with this, just the fact that they're bringing it forward to just one county. I, I don't, don't like it at all. Um, that is being brought forward to the whole state. Um, 1513 is rural school staff recruitment and retention. Um, I mean, that makes sense. Then, oh, 50, uh, I was confused with that one. This is the one that has to deal with rehiring and retired teachers and the affordable care, health care is 1514. But that goes back to the same thing that you were saying, is that. But it's the Affordable Care Act. I mean, no matter what the WASB does or what the state does, it's, it's federal, is it not? Right. But they want clarification, basically, is what, what this tells me. Um, this has a lot to do with uh, um, putting retirees into an HRA, which is for a retiree-only health care reimbursement account. Um, if you do it for retirees only, you can have no active employees engaged in... Um, 
they, they can't be considered an active employee. They can't, a retiree can't come back to work and be considered an active employee. And the clarification needed is, what's the definition of an active employee? Mm -hmm. Because if one of your retirees becomes an active employee, that negates that HRA not only for them, but everybody else that's in it. And so I think that's part of the discussion. They want clarification. In the 30 hours. They want clarification on what that active you employee have, is. I don't know if you've, is there any thought from HR on that one? The, the, re, the rehiring piece specifically? Yeah. Well, this resolution really talks about being able to hire someone back as long as it's for less than 30 hours. So I think, I think it goes right to the discussion we've had, Ryan, before about active versus non-active employees. You know, we're... Well, and, and what, the fu what the future of, of the health retirement benefit may look like as right. well, which is what the, the HRA piece that I'm sure that's a, is getting to as well. Um, the, the vast majority of our retirees that are hired back are for substitute teaching purposes, which is a, is definitely a need of ours. And um, but that definitely falls within the 30 hours, so that that would be useful. I mean, the the guidance that we have right now is we're okay using retired teachers on a intermittent, ir ir irregular. Frequency, we're, we're fine at this point in time. So I think that what you're talking about just reemphasizes that limited use of them. Thank you. Uh, 1515 is the student, student, student Achievement Guarantee and Education or SAGE program. And what they're trying to do is support legislation to shift the emphasis on achievement uh, to program from, from class size reduction to achievement gap reduction. So. So they're having a, the class size number, it's used for the um, RTI, basically, in your, in your bench numbers. That's the way I heard it. Yeah. Which, again, that goes back to whether they're going to continue that program to begin with or whether they're going to fund it. Okay. They want some flexibility to this folks. Uh, 1516, which makes complete sense to me, <laughs> and I, I still. And I'm amazed that you can't do it, but um, allow school board members to serve as a volunteer coach or student advisor. Um, basically, right now, I don't know if everybody understands that, but currently a school board member cannot be a paid coach um, due to certain statutes. And there's still, and when you talk to different people, they have different opinions of yes and no and, and maybe. But uh, basically, it says you cannot volunteer and be a volunteer coach, even though you're willing to give your time because you're a school board member. So this is a um, resolution to allow that to happen. Because you do have a lot of school board mem members that are involved in various things and would like to volunteer their time and do stuff for the school district, especially when it's a non-paying and we have all these funding issues and, and people aren't allowed to do that. Um, I'm a qu my question is on this, is it just pertaining to coaches or student advisors? Or could it be anyone that would be paid out of fund 10? I mean, are they just making it that narrow? Well, I don't, you know, that's still, you couldn't be paid. No, yeah. but it would it would be a different position, not a coach, you're not a student advisor for something else. A board member that's paid out of fund 10. I mean, is it this specific just for these two positions? As I read it, it's just for this. Well, that's, or, that's my question. Or are they, you know, it's just these two positions, and then it's not just coming money out of fund 10. We have the unique position of our hockey coach um, that's paid for by the parents. Um, and it's just run through our account, but it's never any of our district money. The hockey and program is fully self-funded. That's, a, you know, Always angry. right. But then, you know, you look and it go, well, it's coming from fund 10. And, you know, could we have a, could have there been a, a Board member, you know, I think we have a unique situation when it comes to looking at that. It's yeah, it's basically a public employee who's in office. It, whether there's an incap in incompatibility, <laughs> I can't see the word. More or less of a conflict. If it's of incompatible, yeah. Okay. What the statute? Okay, I just want to know if it's as narrow as these two positions, because that's all we're looking at. Well, that's a, that's a unique case. Well, 
it, it may be alluding to the fact that those are the types of positions that are, are it's pretty common to have volunteers serve in those roles. Right. I mean, almost all of our, our high school varsity level programs have volunteer coaches. Okay. So it, it just seems like a natural association that when you've got the existence of volunteers already serving in a coaching capacity, why should the board member be able to do that like any other citizen? That's probably what they're getting at. Right. But yeah, right now under the, the as it got it written, you can't even volunteer your time. You can't. And they, it's viewed within the common that's law. The bit, yeah, that's the common law. Yeah. So common law doctrine of incompatibility. Yeah. And, yes, it does. and then 1517 is uh, teacher shortages and uh, alternative licensure pathways. And um, basically there are areas I'm sure Ryan can attest to it in the special education areas of where qualified teachers, um, your tech ed and your um, Board languages. project lead the way people and that type of thing. Yeah, for example, there has been some discussions apparently of, of some potential legislation coming forward of allowing in the tech ed area, allowing an alternative um, licensure option where individuals with technical degrees rather than regular bachelor um, teacher program certified program uh, degrees being able to, to teach tech ed courses in the high schools that that is very likely to be coming through um, Madison soon that's just one that's just one example one wants to be supports reasonable mess in that effort so. and that is it I would move that we allow Mr. Bendo to use his individual discretion in these areas where something unexpected happens. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second that uh, John be allowed to go to his conscience, I guess, yep. on the resolutions presented tonight at the uh, convention next week. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, for the I just have one more question. If anybody's interested in a copy of the 14 resolutions and what what has happened, um, just to get one of them, the, the first one was this, uh, the uh, resolution about voucher school accountability. Um, there were a pair of bills that were introduced, and at this point, the voucher schools are not yet evaluated under the state system. So those are doing, and then there was another one dealing with um, standards. And there was talk and legislation brought forward. Neither bill passed. In fact, neither bill even received a public hearing. So resolutions from last year. These are resolutions from last year and, and what happened on the current status. So Board members want a copy of that? you want a copy of that? I'd like that. Okay. I'll give it to Marina and then she'll get the cost. Okay. I guess uh, everyone should review the calendar for the next month. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.